to Mysteries and Mimosas and Mystery Monday. My name is Max, and with us today, I have a very special treat for everybody today. My co-host and the old battle axe, Arya, is going to be presenting today's Mystery Monday case. Hi, everyone. You like that, the old battle axe? Yeah. That's <laughs> that's a term of endearment, in case you didn't know. Mm. That's not a jab at you. You're not really a battle axe. You're... Mm -hmm. I, I would best describe Arya as a sour patch kid. <laughs> She's sour on the outside, but sweet in the middle. Oh. Once you break down that sour exterior of Arya, you get a sweet co-host. Hmm. I don't know how to take that. Take it take it for what it's worth. You can take it as a compliment or an insult. I would take it as a compliment. Huh. I called you sweet. Yeah, but after my sour exterior, <laughs> I don't know about that. Well, you also called me spicy today. Yeah, you've been kind of spicy the last couple of days. Hmm. In case uh, you don't know what that means, Arya, that means you're a little extra. Hmm. Yeah, I have to really bust through that sour exterior to get to the true essence of you. That's okay. been difficult, but I think I'm almost there. And, and I think after this episode, we'll be there. Oh, okay. So thank you for joining us for Mystery Monday. If you didn't know, if it's a first time listening, and just a reminder for those that do listen, Mystery Monday is our opportunity to provide you with a short episode with very little information in order to highlight some of those cases that don't have a lot of information out there because they are just as important as the big cases that do have a lot of information, right? Absolutely. Um, the goal is to spread the word about these cases, encourage you to Join in conversation, and of course, the end game is to hopefully help the victims find the answers that they most certainly are looking for and that they deserve. Also, I just want to let everyone know if you have any information about any of our cases that we present, you can reach out directly to us to give us the tips. Also, I just want to let everyone know if you have any information about any of the cases we present, you can reach out to us directly by emailing us at mysteriesandmimosas at gmail.com. You can find us on mysteriesandmimosas.net. We're also on Instagram, at Mysteries and Mimosas Podcast, Facebook, TikTok, YouTube. There's a plethora of ways you can get a hold of us. If you want to reach out directly to Aria to give her the tip, you can find her on her Discord server that is a huge failure, and that's Mimosa Aria. Thank you. I know. I'm done Thanks teasing for pointing you for that out. Uh, no, probably not. But... No, for real. Rest of the episode, no teasing. Oh, rest of the episode, right? Scouts honor. Everyone heard that, so that's not the rest of the day. Well, I, I think it'll be the rest of the episode. That's what I can commit to. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so without uh, wasting any more of your time, Arya, what do you have for us today? I'm really interested and excited to hear this. So today I have the... And I know nothing about this one, just so you know. Right. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. All right, so today's case... It better be good. Oh my gosh. Are you just done? make it good, please. You, you literally just said you were done teasing for the rest of the episode. All right. Ah, uh, broke my promise? Mm hmm Oh, man. I'm so sorry. Okay, now, from this point forward, no more teasing, no more interruptions at all. None. Go okay. Ahead. So today's case is the case of Caleb Harris. During the early morning hours of March 4th, 2024... 21-year-old A&M University student Caleb Harris disappeared from his off-campus Corpus Christi apartment. Caleb was living at the cottages on Ennis Jocelyn Road near South Padre Island Drive with his two roommates and a mutual friend. According to a Fox 3 News article out of Corpus Christi, Caleb played video games at his apartment with his two roommates and that mutual friend during the evening hours of March 3rd. According to the group, they played online for about an hour or so with a former classmate of theirs who lives in Colorado. After playing video games at approximately 12.56 a.m., a ring doorbell camera at a nearby apartment caught Caleb, one of his friends, and one of his roommates playing with a puppy in the apartment complex parking lot. Apparently, the puppy belongs to the girlfriend of one of Caleb's roommates. I wonder what kind of puppy it is. I don't know. It's little. I saw the video. It's just a little puppy. Like, well, I mean, it's a puppy. Obviously, it's little, but it looks like a small breed. Oh. Uh, from what I could tell. Yeah, I'm just curious because we're dog people. I know. It's cute. So everything appeared to be well on that video, and the three of them returned to Caleb's apartment. 
Then, at around 2.20 a.m., one of Caleb's roommates told Caleb he was going to head to bed. Caleb told the roommate that he was going to order some snacks from Uber Eats for his lunch the next day. Then, at 2.44 a.m., Caleb sent a Snapchat video to his younger sister of him walking that puppy through his apartment complex parking lot. I wonder, is that the, that's not the same ring doorbell that they spotted him on? No. Okay, that was earlier. That was earlier. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That was at 12.56 a.m. Okay, so took it for a couple walks then. Yeah, it, it sounds like it, because this is a couple hours later. At 3.03 a.m., Caleb sent another Snapchat photo. This time, the photo was sent to one of his high school friends. The photo was of a small bridge over a drainage ditch in the 1900 block of Ennis Jocelyn Road. And that's the road that his apartment complex is on. Oh, so right in the area. Mm-hmm, yeah. I wonder if he had the puppy with him. I, I don't know. It wasn't in the photo. Oh, okay. So then at 3.12 a.m., Caleb's phone was either turned off or died. Interesting. Mm-hmm. At 3.20 a.m., the Uber Eats driver dropped off the food Caleb had ordered. The driver left the food outside the apartment door. Let me ask you a question. So before you get, before you get back on track with the Uber guy, um, was, did, it, did that picture show anything on that uh, drainage ditch? Did it have water in it? So I don't know what the, the photo showed, but in my research, um, they, the police actually mentioned that it was mostly free of water at that time. And oh. it was like a muddy bottom, but like you could see through to the bottom. And oh, they okay. did search that area. Gotcha. So, okay. yeah. So good, good question. Yeah, it didn't have a lot of water in it at the time. Okay. Well, thanks for clarifying. Yeah. So later on that same morning at 11 a.m., one of Caleb's roommates discovered that food still sitting outside the apartment door. So that indicates he never made it back. Exactly. Or at least he didn't pick up the food. Right. His roommates looked out in the parking lot and saw that Caleb's truck was still parked there. They also located Caleb's wallet and keys in the apartment, but noted that his phone was missing. Have they ever found his phone? No. Due to the circumstances, the roommates became concerned and immediately called the police to report Caleb missing. The assistant chief of the Corpus Christi Police Department has said that Caleb's roommates, the friends he was speaking with over social media that night, and the Uber Eats driver have all been ruled out as having anything to do with Caleb's disappearance. Well, that's good. So at least they looked into him and they were able to clear him pretty quickly, it sounds like. They did, yeah. They questioned them pretty extensively and were able to rule them out and move on, you know, in the investigation. So according to Fox 7 Austin... Police, the FBI, Texas Rangers, U.S. Marshals, and the Secret Service are all working this case. Oh, wow, the Secret Service is involved. I'm guessing they're involved because it has something. Most of the time, they offer a lot of resources to local law enforcement for uh, forensic extractions of cellular devices. And uh, they're, really, they're really the experts, and they, they um, specialize in forensic extractions. Yeah, so interesting you mentioned that because when I first read that, I was like, what in the world is the Secret Service doing involved in this case? Because, you know, my, my, my thinking is, okay, the Secret Service obviously protects, like, dignitaries and the president, and then they are also involved in, like, things to do with, like, the mint and money yeah, and that sure. kind of stuff. Um, but, yeah, I, you're right. That is the reason um, they were helping. The Secret Service is helping with that digital data extraction. Yeah, the Secret Service has a lot of training and uh, equipment that they offer to local law enforcement agencies and assistance in doing data extractions from electronic devices. They actually uh, offer certain courses and stuff to allow people to, to, or, uh, you know, local law enforcement agencies and officers to be certified in those forensic extractions. Yeah, I, I learned something new. I did not know that they were involved in that. Um, so while it's great that they're helping with this case, you know, I hope that they can help find some answers for the family. It does make me wonder, right? I mean, they have the local police, the FBI, Texas Rangers, U.S. Marshals, and then the Secret Service all helping out on this case. But we all too often, unfortunately, hear about other cases that, I mean, they don't have, they have just the local law enforcement resources and nothing else. So why... You know, do certain cases get all of these resources poured into them and then others get nothing? Oh, it's really quite simple. I mean, if you're working a high profile case 
and you are limited in your resources and your ability, all you have to do is reach out and ask for help hmm. from these local, from these federal agencies or other bigger agencies who have the expertise and experience in doing that. I could tell you most recently I was in, uh, the lead detective on a very high profile case in my jurisdiction and um, I was just given an ATF agent's contact information who is the expert in uh, tower dump data and authoring warrants and going through cellular you know, information based on towers. And I just worked with him and he helped me along the process. And, I, and now I know how to do it without his help. So it, it's all about networking and understanding your resources and not being afraid to ask for help when you need it. Yeah. So, I mean, is it fair to say then that sometimes people are too prideful to reach out and, and say, hey, I don't know how to do this. I need help. Yeah. Well, I'm going to tell you the majority of cops are a type A personality. And so pride sometimes does get in the way. Um, and that's that's with all of us. And so no matter what personality type we are, right? I mean, we want to be able to make a difference or we want to be able to be recognized for the work that we do. And so sometimes it's hard to humble ourselves to ask for help when you need it in, in everything other than law enforcement as well. Sure. Well, fortunately, the Corpus Christi Police Department recognized that maybe they could use other resources. So they reached out and they have all of this help now. So hopefully, hopefully they can find some answers. So the Corpus Christi Police Department has issued 82 preservation requests to various social media providers. They've also submitted 63 requests for information to Apple and served 37 search warrants to both internet and cell phone providers. On top of that, they have issued 19 subpoenas to social media and cell phone providers. Yeah, just to give you a little bit of insight on what all that means, a preservation request is kind of where it starts. So let's just imagine for a minute that I'm working a case where there's um, Snapchat, for instance, is, is a component like this one, right? He, he's, he used Snapchat to contact his sister, so they need to find out maybe who else he was talking to. Whatever the case is, they want Snapchat information. A lot of people are under the misnomer that once you take that Snapchat photo and send it, that it's gone. Well, it's gone from your device. It's gone from the recipient's device, but it's not necessarily gone from Snapchat's server. And so the first step in trying to make sure that you get that information is to send them a preservation request, which basically just means, hey, I recognize that there's information on your server pertinent to a criminal investigation. I need you to preserve data from this time period to this time period. And what that does is it allows, you know, whatever provider it is, in this case, Snapchat to say, okay, we're not going to delete anything off our server. Everything's going to be preserved until you write a warrant. And so then the officer then has to, or the detective then has to um, author what's called a production of records. It's actually a court order. It's the same thing as a warrant, compelling Snapchat to provide them all the pertinent information relative to what they need. Hmm. And most of the time it doesn't stop with one production of record warrant, right? I mean, if I'm trying to identify somebody and I write a production of records to Snapchat, I might only get an IP address. Now I'm going to have to do a preservation again, which is easy. It's just basically a letter. And then I'm going to have to write another production of records to the internet service provider once I identify who they are. And typically in cases like this, one production of records leads to another, leads to another, and so on. That's why they've written so that's many. That's why there's so many in this case. Okay. I was going to ask that because that's a lot. That they, it is you know, a lot. They've, they've served a lot. They've had 82 preservation requests, but that makes more sense now that you said that. Yeah, the preservation requests are, are super simple. Most um, providers have like a portal where you can easily just ask them to preserve it and they just honor it without a judge's signature. And so because they have 80 preservations and only like 30 some production of records, I, I've actually done preservations before just on the off chance that I might need to do a production of records and then I didn't need to do it. So yeah, it, it's interesting what that tells me with the 30, uh, 30 some production of records, that means they're, they're diligently looking into, you know, his cell phone data, his social media, and maybe even other people. Yeah. So, I mean, just from the research that I did and the information I was able to find, it seems that this case is rely relying heavily on digital information. 
Yeah, it kind of seems that way because he just kind of goes missing after he sends a picture to his sister on this bridge. Well, no, that was to his friend. He he had sent a video to his sister earlier in the oh right 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 in the morning. Yeah, yeah sorry. Of, of him walking this dog, and then later on he sends that picture of the bridge, and then not long after that, his phone either dies or is shut off. Which I think is really curious. That it is because it could be either one, mm-hmm. and. Without having that actual device in hand and being able to extract the data off of that device, they're not going to know. They're just going to know that it stopped communicating with the networks. Right. It, that At 3.12 a.m., that was the last time his phone connected with a nearby tower, and then, then it was done. Right. Yeah, super interesting case. Yeah, so Caleb's father, Randy, has pleaded with the public to provide information if they have it. There's currently a $50,000 reward, and Randy is hopeful this will elicit information that police can use to find his son. Caleb was last seen wearing white clothing and a baseball cap. It is believed he left his apartment barefoot. Randy believes his son wouldn't leave on his own, especially without his wallet, keys, or shoes. Police have received hundreds of tips so far from as far away as Florida, but nothing has panned out yet. And there's nothing out there to indicate that he would just up and leave? No. According to his his father, that'd be very uncharacteristic of him. And and apparently it seems like his room, roommates also thought it was odd because they they didn't wait, you know? You hear all the time about people like, oh, well, he's an adult, you know, maybe he, he left and he'll be back. But his roommates immediately reported him. As soon as they saw that he hadn't picked up his Uber Eats order and his truck was there and his wallet and his keys are there, but he and his phone are gone, they immediately were like, okay, something is wrong. This is not something normal for him. This is out of character. We need to tell somebody. And they called the police. So yeah. good on them. No, those know? are those are great friends. Yeah, those are great friends for sure. have. So Caleb is described as a white male with brown hair and brown eyes. He's 5 feet, 11 inches tall, and weighs about 180 pounds. If you have any information on the disappearance of Caleb Harris, please call the Corpus Christi Police Department at 361-886-2840 or 361-886-2600. Well, thank you for presenting that case. You did a great job. Thank you. I'm really happy with this one. Thanks. No, you did a good, seriously, I'm not even teasing you because I promised I wouldn't. Right. It's excellent. Thank you. I really do hope that, you know, they find answers. Of course, in any of our cases, I want them to find sure. answers. But, you know, um, this one, I mean, Caleb, it, it seems like he's very loved and missed by his family and his friends. Um, and this is just out of character for him. Um, so hopefully, hopefully this podcast may, maybe reaches yeah. someone that knows something. I don't right. know. You know, and hopefully if you have information, you'll reach out to uh, provide that. Please reach out to us. You can stay anonymous if you reach out to us. We'll pass it along. That's actually happened several times since we've been doing this. Mm -hmm. We've only been at it since uh, November November of last year. Yeah. And I'll be honest with you. I'm having fun. I'm enjoying this. I want to continue to do this. And what makes me the most excited is actually getting tips from people. Me and too. it's happened, and we're super happy to be a part of that. Absolutely. Which, you know, brings me to another point that if you know of a case, you know, that hasn't really gotten a lot of media attention or there's not a lot of resources being poured into it, please reach out to us. Let us know. And we are happy to cover those cases. Yeah. Even if there's no information and you just want to have us take a look at it, we're happy to do that. Absolutely. And if you want to help us out, go ahead and click uh, five stars. I think that's how it works. I don't really know because I don't rate things typically. I don't really know how that works. Yeah, it's on Spotify. You can rate us with five stars or Apple Apple Podcasts. Yeah, give us five stars and leave us a comment. Tell your family and your friends about us, as mentioned earlier. Tell your enemies about us, too. Ooh. Tell everybody. As my daughter would say, tell your ops about us. Our ops? Ops. I think it's for opponents. I don't know anything about that. That's, That's what, the very first time I've ever heard that. Right no, now. she says that all the time. She's like, oh, these ops. And I'm like, what is an op? And she's like, it's my enemies. I'm like, why do you have enemies? I don't get it. I don't either. But they're ops. Yeah. Tell, tell your ops about us. Okay, there you have it. Tell your ops about us. And in the meantime, cheers. Cheers. <laughs>